May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What makes you clean? I remember growing up, the answer we were given, well, bath time. Right? You take a bath and you get clean. That's how it works. But now, thinking back on that, and I verified my memory with my siblings, there was just this, this one thing. We all used the same bath water. And I have a lot of siblings. So I'm thinking through this, you know, the, the, the dirt that came off of my older sisters into that bath water, when I got in, hmm. I'm just glad I was fifth and not 14th. But somehow we survived, right? We, uh, we, we must have gotten somewhat clean, but I always wonder, how clean was I really? <clears throat> what makes you clean? What makes anything clean? I googled some cleaning hacks and was amazed at some of the things that people use to get stuff clean, right? I mean, the... Uh, <clears throat> olive oil to get out fingerprint stains and essential oils to clean your microwave and toothpaste, not for your teeth, no, for your shoes or for the, uh, the gunk that burns on your pan. There was vinegar for your eyeglasses and supposedly that makes it so they don't fog up later and there's, there's shaving cream to clean the water stains on your shower glass and uh, salt for fabric stains and oh, one, one place said wine to get out the carpet, but then another one said you use vodka to get out the wine stains in the carpet. So what makes things clean? That's what we're talking about today. But especially, not just things, what makes you clean? And, and here, I'm not talking about just using fresh bath water or taking a shower. We're talking about what makes you clean Inside, What makes you right with God? The Pharisees in our gospel had an answer for that, right? Keep the law. Follow the tradition of the elders and, and then you'll be clean. But, well, you see, God had given his people of Israel a set of laws that was designed to keep them separate, to keep them distinct from the nations around them so that he could fulfill his promise of sending a savior through their genealogy, through their line. And then Jesus came and fulfilled that law. And he said, that law doesn't bind us anymore. <clears throat> but as he was here fulfilling that law, they ran into a problem. You heard it in our text. The Pharisees saw Jesus' disciples eating food, but they hadn't given their hands the ceremonial washing that the tradition of the elders, that the rabbis had said was needed. You see, the, the, uh, the law was the law, but then over the years, the rabbis had added more and more of these other rules. They call them the, the Mishnah. Let me, let me read for you their definition of Mishnah. It was a hedge around the written Torah, that's their name for the Old Testament Bible, this hedge was to guard against any possible infringement of the Torah by ignorance or accident. So they had added so many rules on top of God's law to make sure that no one got even close to breaking God's law. <clears throat> but the problem came that they, they were so intent on staying out of the ditch on one side of the road that they overcorrected and found themselves firmly embanked in the ditch on the other side of the road. There were times, and, and, and they, they got to the point where they said that the Mishnah superseded God's law. Jesus, in the verses between the two parts of our text, he gives an example. He, he talked about Korban. So he said they, they were setting aside the fourth commandment, you know, honor your father and mother. He said, when you're not taking care of your parents and you're using that money that you should have been using for that and saying, this is all for God, then we don't have to do that. I read another example of a rabbi who was put in prison. His name was Akiba, and he was given enough water, just enough to sustain his life. 
instead of drinking it, he decided he needed to be ceremonially clean, and so he used it for that ceremonial washing, and then he died of thirst. Something's off there, right? So when these Pharisees came at Jesus for not making his disciples jump through all the extra hoops that they had added on, Jesus calls them what they are, hypocrites. One thing on the outside, but something very different on the inside. Look at verse 8. He says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Have you ever done that? Have you ever found an excuse not to, to, to really keep God's command because, well, the way the world sees things is a little bit different. I made a rationalization doing something that God says is wrong, but, but no, this, this will just be better. Familiar with, with some of the exemptions, right? The bless her heart exemption on the Eighth Commandment, that if you start a conversation by saying bless her heart, you don't have to worry about the Eighth Commandment. You can go ahead and slander and gossip all you want, but you blessed her heart, so it makes it okay, right? No. Or maybe it's the, uh, the corporate excess exclusion to the Seventh Commandment, where if a corporation just makes way too much money, then it's okay for you to be not completely honest, or maybe, maybe take a couple of shortcuts with them. Or maybe it's just the whole putting God first part of the First Commandment. Right? We say, well, if I'm doing this to be able to provide for my family or, or, or to enjoy God's creation or, or to be able to uh, 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 spend family time, well, then God's okay being second or third or fourth. <clears throat> Have I hit yours yet or do I need to, to keep going? It, if I haven't hit yours, just think about it a little bit. You will come up with some, some ways that you try to get around God's law. We all do. The things that everyone else are doing are so much easier to follow than God's law. The wrongs that I've suffered try to convince me that, that it's okay for me to not necessarily follow God's will for how I react. Jesus was speaking to us when he said, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And Jesus isn't good with that. God isn't good with that. And that might get under our skin. It certainly got under the Pharisees' skin, but, but if that did, what, what he said next really would have ruffled some feathers. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. But Jesus, what about all those laws of cleanliness, right? That was scripture. That God gave those laws of clean and unclean. You know, they, they weren't supposed to eat pork. They weren't supposed to eat shellfish or, or certain kinds of birds. They, they, they weren't supposed to touch a dead body or, or, or mess with mold at all. Those were unclean things, and God had said that. So Jesus, what are you talking about when you're saying that nothing that comes from the outside in can, can make someone unclean? Isn't that exactly what God said? Jesus says, understand this. Understand his point. He's making it very clear that, it, that it's not so much the what we do, or it's not only the what we do, it, it's why we do it. So, so pork, pork in and of itself could, I mean, it had no power, but it was the person's use of it. It was the, the, the fact that they didn't want to follow God's will, that, that they decided to eat the pork. That's what made them unclean. Or, or, or shellfish was not going to contaminate anyone, but it was their attitude not trusting God enough to follow his will for their lives. So you see what he's saying? It's not just the what. 
that makes us clean or unclean. It's, it's why we do it. And I'm guessing that, that you guys haven't worried too much about whether or not you're keeping the Old Testament ceremonial laws since Jesus has fulfilled all of those and, and we're free to, to eat bacon and shrimp and, and all of that. But when Satan gets a good temptation, he doesn't let go of it. This whole aspect of, of ritualism, you've probably felt that. Right? So, try this one on size. Yeah, I know that... Uh, um, you know, maybe I gossip a little bit, or, or I get angry, or I, I say some things I shouldn't, but at least I go to church every week. What's that doing? It, it's making it about the, the what I do and not the why I do it. It's, it's trying to, to, to get around what God actually says and, and, and make myself feel, feel better. Or have you ever asked yourself, how regularly do I really need to come to church to be good with God? Do I have to go to Bible study too, like Pastor keeps encouraging? Think about what's, what's going on in the heart when those questions are asked. Are, they, are, are you making those decisions seeing God as who he is, the one who loves you and has given you everything and, and who has made you who you are, that you want to be with and you want to grow in a relationship with him. So, so you make the decision based on that. Whatever the decision ends up being, is that where it's coming from? Or is it sometimes coming from that little bit of pharisaical pride that says, no, I've done enough. I do more than most. Now let me back to my time. When we're talking about being clean, Jesus asks, what's going on in the heart? Are you seeing God as the harsh taskmaster that you have to obey or your awesome father that you, you can't wait to be with? Probably depends on the day. I know it does for me. And when I realize just how much unclean there is in my heart, what to do? Well, it's the same answer as before. Bath time. Right? I started talking about a bath that I wasn't sure exactly how clean it got me, but, you know, my parents brought me to another bath, one that uh, Paul described, calling it a, a washing with water through the word. Peter called it this baptism that saves, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. In the waters of your baptism, you were washed clean. Everything unclean in your heart was removed and you were made God's precious child. He says he gives you that pledge in baptism, that pledge from God that you are right with him because of what Jesus has done. That's why we see Jesus here in this text. That's why he says what he does about what doesn't make us, or what, what doesn't make us clean and what does. And he's given it to you. The gift of baptism. The power of the word whereby he declares your sins forgiven. The food of the Holy Supper, his body and blood for your forgiveness. You want to be clean? No matter how much of this you use, it's not going to do it. Even sitting in the right seats at church, and if you're wondering, it's these front rows. Those are the, the right ones. Even that, that doesn't do it. If you want to be clean, only God can do that. Only he can clean your heart so that what comes out of it is not the unclean, but, but the clean. And he did it. That's why he sent this rabbi we see in our text, different from all the others, who lived love instead of law. Or better, who lived love through the law, the real law, God's law. See, it's not what was in your heart. It's what was in God's heart. 
He so had you in his heart that he let these Pharisees tell him he was wrong. He so had you in his heart that, that, that he let himself be called wrong, be condemned as wrong for every one of our sins. He so had you in his heart that he shed most of his human heart's blood at the thorns and the nails and the flogging and the spear. He so had you in his heart that his human heart stopped beating. He died for you. And then he rose. He had you in his heart so that he could cleanse yours. Because we needed that transplant. We needed all of the stain and sin of, of our hearts removed and replaced with the blood of Jesus, his son, that purifies us from all sin. You want to be clean? Let God do it. He gives you that clean heart through faith. And faith comes from hearing the message. And faith is fed in his holy supper as he gives us his body and blood for our forgiveness, cleansing our hearts, preparing us so that we can go from here with hearts that are clean. That everything that comes from them is what comes from clean hearts. Love. In Christ, you are clean. Amen.